Okay. All right, so we're starting Chavakuk. That's in the Fall of Prophets. If you have the Arts Girl Milstein edition, this will be on page 316, 317. You have a volunteer translator. I'll I'll do the uh, Hebrew, and then uh, someone could use the translation. Please use only a Masoretic text for translation for, trans for translation, and uh, and then uh, you know if if you don't have the art school, that's okay. We can make two uh, for a translation, and we'll go over it again afterwards after. Now ask the philosophical midrash question. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry. Very good. We'll see. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll do some translating. We'll see how the how the eyeballs hold up, and we'll do. We'll see what we can do. Can you turn your volume up just a little bit, Rama? My volume up. Let me check. Testing one, two, three, testing. How's that? That's better, really. Is that better or worse than the same? It's about the same. Testing one, two, three, testing. Up all the way. Or was. Okay, that'll work. Works? Okay. Very good. Okay, first the uh, the original prophecy in the Hebrew. Amasa Asher Chazar Chabaku Adonai Adonai Shivati Vlosi Shema Ezaki Lecha Chamat Vloso Shia Lama Sareni Avon Lamal Tabit Veshod Vchamas Benegdi Vahi Riv Madon Yisa Akin Tafug Torah Vloyet Sein Lenetzach Mishpat Irasha Maktir Esatzari Akin Yetse Mishpat Muka Ruvagim Vabitu Vitamu Tamahu Kifual Poel Vimechem Losa Minu Ki Supar Ki Hinni make him as a casting Agoy Hamar Vanim Har Holech Lamer Habe Eretz Loreshes Mishkanos Lo Lo Ayom Venorahu, Mimanu, Mishpato, Use so Yetze, the Kalu, Min, Min, the Mirim, Susa, the Hadu, Miz Eve, Erev, Pashu Parashav, Uparashav, Mirahok Yabo, Yaufu, Kinesher Hush, the Hall, Kulolo Hamas, Yabo, Magamas, the Nehem, Kadima. Yasof Tahol Shabi, Hu Bamalachim Yis Kalat, Rosnim Miss Haklo, Hu Lahomit Sor, Yis Hak, by its four of four of Ayu Kedar, Az Halaf, Rafa Avor, Vashem Zuhoho, Eloho, Alo Ata, Mikedem Adonai Elohai, Kiroshi, Lonamus, Adonai Mishpat. Samto Vitsur Lahochia Kisanto. Tahor in Naim Mir Osra, Rabit Alamal Lo Sukho, Lama Sabit Bogdim, Taharish, Lovala Rasha, Tadik Menu. Atase Adam Kidige, Hayam, Karemes, Lo Moshel Bo. Kulo Bechaka He Allah, you go Rehu. The Hermo Yasin and Mith Marto Alkin Ismach Biagil Alkin Isabeach the Hermo Bikater a Mith Marto Ivahema Shamain Kelko Mahol Mahalo Beria Alkin Yarik Hermo the Samid the Haro Goyim Lo Yachmo. All right. If you could uh, attempt the translation. All right. The prophecy of Habakkuk. The prophet saw, how long, O Hashem, will I cry out and you not hear me? 
How long will I cry out to you regarding injustice and you not save? Why do you allow me to see iniquity and you look at evil deeds with robbery and injustice before me? While the one who carries strife and contention still remains. That is why the Torah is weakened and justice never emerges. Since the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice emerges distorted. Look among the nations and observe and be utterly astounded. For God is bringing about an occurrence in your days that you will not believe when it is related. For behold, I am establishing the Chaldeans that bitter and impetuous nation that will go across the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not its own. It is awesome. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is awesome and terrifying. It's judgment and it's burden. Go forth from it. It's horses are swift, swifter than leopards and fiercer than wolves of the evening and its horsemen are fleet. Its horsemen will come from afar. They will fly like an eagle hastening to eat. It comes entirely for plunder. The eagerness of their faces is like the east wind and it will gather captives like the sand. He scoffs at kings and officers are his sport. He laughs at every stronghold, heaping up earth and capturing it. Then a spirit will come and pass over him and he will incur guilt by saying that his God gave him strength. Are you not from the beginning of time, O Hashem, my God, my Holy One? Let us not die, O Hashem. You face, you have ordained him for judgment and you, O rock, you have established him to chasten us. Your eyes are too pure to see evil, and you cannot look upon wrongdoing. Why then do you look upon betrayers? Why do you remain silent when a wicked man swallows up one more righteous than he. You have made man like the helpless fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler. He brings them all up with a fish hook. He catches them in his net and he gathers them in his trawl. Therefore, he rejoices and exalts. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his trawl. For through them, his portion is fat and his food is plentiful. Shall he therefore empty his net to slay nations uh, continuously?
without compassion. That's it. Very good. Yeah. Let's go into the art scroll commentary. This is at the bottom of page uh, 316, 316 in the Art Scroll Millstein edition. Little is known regarding the background of the prophet Habakkuk, for scripture mentions neither his generation nor his lineage. Uh, but according to Seder Olam in chapter 20, he was a contemporary of the prophets Joel and, and, and uh, Nahu, and prophesied during the days of Manasseh, king of Judah. The uh, Medrash Yalkut Shimoni says that also that uh, he was in the same generation with, with Nahu. And so during the days of King Manasseh. However, this is not mentioned by scripture for it did not, for it, scripture did not wish to associate the name of the righteous prophet with the evil King Manasseh. Manasseh again was the, uh, the Jewish king who banned the Torah. So notorious, uh, notoriously wicked. So therefore it's not appropriate to, uh, to associate the prophet with that. Since uh, Manasseh had many years of rule, uh, therefore um, it was the entire career of Habakkuk as a prophet was during the reign of Manasseh. So therefore there's no other king to mention. Uh, and that was of course, after the destruction of the Northern tribes. So the, the, um, the, uh, the book could not even mention a, a different king from a different kingdom of Israel. Uh, you had a question? After, after doing, after doing tshuva, tshuva and having all of his sins cleansed from this world, did King Ahab really merit own Haba? Well, this is, this is talking about King Manasseh. King Manasseh is discussed in the Gemara in Perkah Chelak in Sanhedrin. The, the, the chapter um, 10 in the Mishnah, chapter 11 in the Gemara. So it discusses, uh, <clears throat> did King Manasseh uh, guarantee a portion in the world to come? It, so it seems the Gemara settles on the idea that uh, Manasseh was restored to his kingdom when he repented, but he did not repent enough. He, he still left the people devastated and uh, separated from the Torah. He didn't repent what he did to the people. He only repented from continuing to force the people to idolatry. So as far as, uh, so just saying sorry to God for going after a different God, uh, in other words, but uh, still continuing the, uh, the the his assault on the Torah incidentally by by not restoring the Torah, so therefore it was still effectively a, a political repentance, not a real repentance. A real repentance <clears throat> creates a change for the better, whereas the change for the better really was what God did when after Manasseh was was captured, uh, you know, it's detailed in the Book of Kings. He was captured by the enemy. God freed him, and uh, because he he uh, pledged to repent from jail, and uh, but he didn't repent completely. So therefore, according to the, the um, Quran Sanhedrin, it seems like he did not go to heaven, even though he was restored to his power. <clears throat> and the fact that Manasseh. <clears throat> ruled over the, um, the kingdom of, Ju of Judah for 55 years, indicates that <clears throat> apparently he got his reward um, in this world. He wasn't rewarded in the next world. <clears throat> okay, um, any other questions or we'll go back into the uh, article for the commentary. Chabakuk was a disciple of the prophet Nahum, 
Rabbam in the introduction to Mishnah Torah. It prophesies during the rise of the Babylonian Empire under the leadership of its king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so in this chapter, we mentioned Chaldeans. Chaldeans is the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and um, and he foretold that harm that the harm that the king would inflict on the people of Judah, <clears throat> uh, he would all that the, that the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar would inflict harm on the people of Judah. He also foretold the eventual downfall and destruction of Nebuchadnezzar's descendants at the hands of the Persians and Medes. And this is mentioned by the commentaries of Radak and Ibn Ezra. Our school continues with alternative scholarship, uh, but um, you're free to uh, learn that on your own. It doesn't seem uh, consistent with the um, with the majority of the commentaries. Okay, so now on the first verse, prophecy the the um, the Hebrew term masa, literally a burden, is one of ten expressions of prophecy enumerated. Enumerated in the in the uh, in the Medrash, Bereshis Raba in chapter forty four. Now Bereshis Raba actually was written in the time of the Mishnah, so it actually it, it's over two thousand years old. It it predates other texts by other monotheistic religions. The Medrash Raba on, on Genesis. So it's written there, according to the sages, it introduced a faithful and for, forbidding prophecy. It is most often used to introduce a prophecy that is directed to the nations of the world. A Barbanel maintains that the term Masa is used when the prophecy is being directed to just one person or just one nation. Okay, so the next... Um, the next paragraph is discussing the difference in in uh, in the seeing of the prophet. Why is the term chaza uh, like so a vision instead of ra'a, just regular seeing used? <clears throat> According to Rashi, um, the prophet saw the prophecy that Habakkuk uh, received through divine inspiration. That's why the terminology chaza is used. Whereas ra is used to describe physical sight. Chazon is related to chaze, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the chest, the breast, the seat of the heart, uh, seems to mean uh, seeing in a spiritual sense, perceiving and comprehending that which is invisible to the physical eye. This is uh, Rabbi Hirsch on Genesis. That's Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch from Germany uh, in the, in the uh, 19th century. So it's, uh, it's um, a uh, interesting and unusual reaction. Uh, the Habakkuk is, it seems to be uh, troubled by the prophecy that he, he keeps seeing about the success of the evil people, but he's not yet seeing their destruction. So therefore he's, he's complaining about um, that he's trying to guide to, to, to save the people and it, it, why isn't it happening? Okay, so now it is a debate. Is he talking though about the oppression from the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, or the oppression by the wicked king Menashe? Because we see in, in verse four, verse three talks about robbery and injustice, which is not what the, the reign of Menashe is known for uh, so much, but verse four certainly. Uh, makes one think about the evil uh, reign of Menashe. Uh, 
That is why the Torah is weakened and just, justice never emerges. So therefore it's a debate among the scholars. Uh, is he um, discussing Babylon or, or Menashe? And uh, then, okay, so now on the part of verse four, where it says, uh, since the wicked surround the righteous, this is on the lower right column of the article commentary in verse three, on, on, chap on page 317 in the Milson edition of 12 Prophets. Since the wicked surround the, the righteous, the root of the word is um, similar to that of the crown. Uh, the wicked Nebuchadnezzar surrounds the righteous Israel as the crown and circles with the head. That's so he surrounds them that's so that he may continuously oppress them. Radak. Although the kingdom of Judah was deserving of punishment at this time, scripture refers to them as righteous when compared to Nebuchadnezzar. That's it. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was... <clears throat> kind of like a person you would not want to have lunch with. He liked to eat bunny rabbits while, while they were still alive. So that, that's one of the, um, the most uh, disgusting uh, table manners, uh, you know, which was, out shattering Henry VIII. Which VIII's. was banned by America today. Yes, yes. And, and of course it's against the Noahide laws. Even before the laws were, uh, were given on Sinai, uh, since the time of Noah, the, the cruelty to animals has been uh, forbidden to everyone. And not just that, if we had nets, or instead of acting like a normal human, he acted like a beast in, in Rome. Yeah, so Nebuchadnezzar did act like a beast. And we see in, in uh, Daniel, he later was punished by, by uh, having his mind, his mind became deranged for, for a time. And he was literally uh, acting like a beast in the field. Uh, and uh, you know, a wild barbarian grabbing food from and eating animals. Since even when he was in his palace, he was eating animals while they were alive. So, so it's like it was a, a punishment. God punished him in the same way. Therefore, his punishment was he had to continue to eat them. But only he forgot that he was a king. He, he just felt he was another animal fighting animals. Uh, so that Why? he wandered a bit. Wrong. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh my! Uh, th that too, but uh, I don't think that part of the uh, discussion is uh, any longer in Kansas. Okay, so, all right, uh, let's get back to the book. Back to the book. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions before we continue? Okay. Okay, so um, just to remind you of the the, um, the conquering countries in that time. First, you had the Assyrians in, in Ninveh, uh, who were um, spared in the book of Jonah, but continued to sin in the book of Nahum and were destroyed. And they were destroyed by the Chaldeans. And um, the Chaldeans were shocking. Uh, people um, couldn't, couldn't, were astonished about the terrible, wicked and terrible deeds of Nebuchadnezzar. And this is Har the, and the commentary Haro, in chef and verse five. Haro was killed in Ninveh because that was the same Haro in Moshe's time. Oh yeah, the, I mean that's it's a, it's a debate. Of course, uh, Barvanel uh, is of the school of thought. It's better not to assume that people lived for four hundred years, you know, after um, the time of Noah. Uh, but uh, there are. <clears throat> There are several cases in, in the uh, Agada and the Medrash where people did live over 120 years. So they lived over 400 years. I, you know, when when there, you know, if, if a if a allegory says 
the the elephant turned into a frog. So there has to be a compelling reason why we assume this really happened. But if the allegory is, instead of making an allegory saying, no, this person actually lived so many years. So now it's, it's like, in other words, it's making a declaration, you know, it, that, that could be debunked for what purpose? You know, saying the elephant turned into a frog, so now you're thinking, oh, the elephant was weakened. It's, it's at least a metaphor, right? But saying this person lived for 400 years, what is the value is a metaphor? So the, the Talmudic phrase, when it says that, um, you know, for example, it says uh, Pharaoh um, it was the same king as uh, the, the king in Nineveh, or vice versa. Um, if it's not literal, like a Barbano would prefer, so then you would say that the king of Nineveh at first didn't listen to God until he had no choice. Then when he was told the, the, the country was about to be destroyed unless he repented, then he repented. Now, Pharaoh is not known as the, the great repenter of history. Uh, he repeated, uh, he repeated uh, his abstinence over 10 times. However, he is the first um, evil king recorded who said that uh, me and my people sin. If you look in Exodus, it's right there. So um, Pharaoh, at least externally, made a, um, it became a symbol of a king who is evil, who at least talks about repentance. Uh, and now when we, we find it with the juxtaposition of uh, Jonah and, and Nahum that, um, that effectively the, the repentance by Ninveh was for less than one full generation. Uh, so it was also reminiscent of Pharaoh where Pharaoh uh, promised to let the people go. He let the people go, then he changed his mind. So there were still people living, surviving from before Jonah came who joined in uh, the evil of, in the generation of, of, of Nahu. And that's Ninveh. So Ninveh was destroyed by the wicked and cruel Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans would be destroyed by the more noble uh, Persian Medes. All right, and then after that, of course, it takes us to the Grecian era and then the Roman era. In verse 10, it talks about God scoffing at kings. And officers are a sport. He laughs at every stronghold, keeping up earth and cap capturing it. Um, but the, according to Barbara this refers to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> was just uh, disrespectful of the people he was conquering. You know, like uh, you're, if you're, you're watching your favorite basketball team being humiliated by another team, and like every time the, the, uh, the opposing guy scores, he, he, he uh, mouths off at your favorite player. So that's an un unpleasant experience. So that's, that's what was occurring here. Really, it's only God who could do that because if God, you know, God is a creator and wielder of worlds. Uh, so therefore, um, 
therefore, you know, any kind of human built defense is, 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 uh, is deserving of derision if, if it's assumed that it would keep God out. But for a human king to, to say that when, you know, every, every conquered, every conqueror has eventually been conquered. So it's just, you know, Nebuchadnezzar should have thought maybe it's just a cycle of history in, some, in a sense. Instead, uh, he was like pounding his chest with, 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 uh, with pride. Um, it's a very difficult time in history when, you know, famous people in the world were, were the, the, you know, were, uh, you know, unpleasant individuals like Nebuchadnezzar. When you have Moses as a famous person, obviously the world is, is in a be better place. People are, are talking about his righteousness and stuff like that. Nebuchadnezzar, it's just, you know, a guy who seemed more happy being an animal than a human. And yet God blessed him to, to be able to conquer other nations. So now if, if a uh, king were to send one of his messengers in their regal uh, clothing and they went to uh, another king as a representative, so that, uh, that's common. If a king were to send one of his representatives to save someone from danger, uh, that's common. Or to punish someone else, that's common. But if a king were to send someone who thinks of him like an enemy and and be able to send that person uh to to conquer someone else that that shows real real uh true um political power so the uh is 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 unpleasant as some of the things the babylonians did and and uh, some of the concepts of uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself. Still, he represented God's ability to make even the wicked do his will. And they are rejoicing in doing his will because they think they're acting with arrogance. If God had told him a prophecy, go and conquer this nation, his first reaction would, would be, probably a, a re refusal or after I get to the nation I want to attack. But God was able to work behind the scenes and turn one of his, it's possible to, to, to call him an enemy into one of his servants. It's an amazing concept that uh, so, I mean, that, that shows God's true power. He, God could have more easily just sent an angel. Instead, he sent an enemy of, of human, of God and, and an enemy of the humans, and he did God's will precisely. That is power. Thank you.
Okay, we had some more people come in. Uh, any questions? Continuing in the commentary on chapter one of Kabbalah. Okay, so on, on verse 12, O oh Lord, you have ordained him for judgment. So Radak comments on this, has he not been appointed only to punish those who rebel against you and to chastise the nations of the world? So, you know, God is, is kind and merciful. So if God is really angry, then he would send someone who is less kind than him to punish. You understand? So the punishment of, uh, of sending a Nebuchadnezzar was, was a, a bigger punishment than sending a different nation. Uh, so from the depictions in um, the, the Book of Lamentations, it seems that the, the, ba the Babylonians were much more cruel to the Judeans than the Assyrians had been to the ten tribes in the northern kingdom. And the next generation after they punished the ten tribes as, as God's rep representative punishment, then Ninveh was destroyed in, in the book of, uh, as, as, as foretold in, in uh, Nahum. And in the book of Daniel is the famous final, final night of the rule of the Chaldeans. Belshazzar sees the writing on the wall. It's a fascinating uh, discussion there. Check out the book of Daniel. Very nice. Yeah. Now, verse 13 is, 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 is amazing because God creates everything. God rules over everything. Nothing could, could hide from God. Uh, and the prophet is, in a sense, feeling sorry for God that, you know, people can, can look the way people can fall asleep. People could pass out and faint, but God can't do any of those. He's omnipotent. So therefore, he cannot turn it off. God, whatever disgust a, a righteous man has at, at the workings of evil, God, in a sense, is, is being exposed to more than that. Uh, but, of course, the way God... Um, reacts to that is different than humans. God does not have animal animalistic um, emotions. <clears throat> so therefore God can never be overwhelmed with anger. It's, it's, a, it's a calculation, not a knee jerk reaction by God. And in fact, we see that God set up Moses to talk to him whenever he was very angry. And, and so that the uh, children of Israel would have a minimal punishment and not be destroyed. Uh, so, so God is able to have more than one emotion at the same time. And uh, so even though God is exposed, in a sense, to the happenings on the world, whether or not uh, it's, 
it's um, what you would want the king in heaven to watch. You know, he sees it all. So therefore, even though he's all powerful, not able to be overwhelmed by it, still, in in effect, what what Habakkuk is saying here, God deserves better. So let's look again at thirteen. Your eyes are too pure to see evil, and you cannot look at look upon wrongdoing. Uh, look upon wrongdoing as an enjoyable looking, not that you, there's any weakness in God. Why then do you look upon betrayers? Why do you remain silent when a wicked man swallows uh, more than uh, one more righteous than he? Let's look at the commentary. It's an interesting, interesting way to put it. That um, you know, God, God deserves better. God cannot turn it off. Since God cannot turn it off, it's a sign that he's not uh, overwhelmed by it. So therefore, the logical decision is to punish the extremely wicked. Understand? So let's look in the commentary directly. Your eyes are too pure to see evil. Habakkuk continues his appeal to God and adds the following argument. You, God, are the epitome of goodness. You choose those who do good and despise those who commit evil. How do you permit that which is contrary to your wisdom and goodness to take place? Why do you permit the Chaldeans to do evil to Israel? From the commentary of the Radat. Matsuro says, why, do you, why then do you look upon betrayers? Why then do you provide those who rebel against you by granting them the rule over such a vast kingdom? understand so if if the idea is bring justice against the sinners of Israel through Babylon so but Babylon are even worse sinners how does how is this an honor to you but again the point is God is merciful so if a nation needed a cruelty it's not happening directly from God there would have to be someone who chooses that evil. And no angel is that corrupt. Only a human could, could potentially be that corrupt. So only the very wicked can be used as a source of punishment when a punishment had to be a bit uh, tougher than, than God would normally give. However, if, if that cruel nation acts even more cruel than anyone expects, for example, a classical example is the Nazis in the Holocaust. So then there is a divine retribution for going too far. It's not, there's, there is not going to be a, a verse in the Bible. Uh, if another book is added when, when Mashiach comes, there's not going to be a verse that, they, that um, the Nazis are, are called the servant of God. However, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and Cyrus the Great, they, they could be called servants of God in that sense because they were picked for their, their, their abilities. And in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was um, a corrupt individual, he was punished in his lifetime by becoming a, a, a wild nomad uh, in the forest until eventually he, his uh, sanity was returned. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a punishment in his life and he acknowledged that, that God is powerful. That, that is different than the Nazis who, who were trying to kill the last person until the day they die. You understand? So as, as horrible as the Babylonians were, there was some aspect of good in them that, that they, you could not really compare them fully to a Nazi. But if you look in the Book of Lamentations, uh, some of the things they did were pretty close.
Okay, so the parable of the net at the end of chapter one. Let's look at the commentary in verse 17. Shall he therefore empty his net? Our translation translation of Yorik as empty follows Radak. Renders is it because he attributes his power to his, his deity that he succeeds in emptying his net each day? The prophet is asking why God rewards Nebuchadnezzar with success each day when he denies God's existence and worships idols. Radak. Although Rashi translates Yorik Hermo as arm himself with his net. The intent of the verse is similar. Rashi adds that the prophet is asking a rhetorical question. Is it proper in God's eyes that Nebuchadnezzar should think of his continuous success to, is due to the worship, his worship of idols? Of course not. Alternatively, Matsudos explains, will he ever empty his net and release his captives if he experiences continuous success? So uh, it is possible to say that this prayer in the midst of prophecy of Habakkuk is later answered and recorded in the book of Daniel. So when you cover the book of Daniel, remember this prophecy from Habakkuk. Okay, any questions before chapter two? Any questions? All right, let's first read the art scroll introduction to chapter two before we go into the Hebrew. We'll also need a volunteer translator. Uh, can we, can someone please volunteer to be a translator of chapter two when I finish the English introduction and the Hebrew? Uh, I'll do it, Rebbe. Uh, Teresa, just volunteer, yeah? Yes. Okay. All right, first the art scroll commentary. Uh, this is very short. Um, let's see, no, it continues. Yeah, okay, very short. Okay, the bottom of page 323. In the previous chapter, Habakkuk asks, questions God justice in the face of the success of the wicked and the distressing conditions of the righteous. The prophet now awaits God's reply. <laughs> Al Mishmarti Moda Ves Yatsva Al Matsorv Atape, the Ros Maya Daberbi, Ma Ashiv Al Tokhti, Oya Anani Adonai, my American soul, Kazon, Uva Air Al Halukos, Lamanya Roots, Kore Vo, Ki Od Kazon Lamoid, Biafeach, La Kates, Vloy Hazeu, Emis Maham Ma Kakilo. Allah Mashal Yusau Melitza Chidos Lo Ermarhoi Amarbe Lo Lo Adma Sai O Machbid Allah Av Avkit Halo Pesa Yakumu Nosh Hecha Victu Meza Zecha Vaisa Lim Shisos Lamo Kata Shalosa Goim Rabim Yashalah Yishalucha Hol Yeser Ami Midmeid Adam Bahamas Eretz Kirya Rahol Yoshve Va Haibotsea Betza Ra the Beso Lasum Bamarom Kino Lahinatsel Mikaf Ra Yaad Yaadsta Boshes Lubesecha Kitsos Amin Rabim Bahote Nafshecha Yevin Mikir Tiz Ak the Hafis Mechets, 
מעץ יעננה. אוי בונה עיר בדמים וכונן קריה ועבלה. הלא הנה מעץ אדוני צבאות ויגעו עמים ודי אש ולאומים ודי ריק יאפו. כי תמלא הארץ לדעת את כבוד אדוני כמים יכעסו על הים. אוי משקה ראהו מספח חמסך ואף שקר למען הביט על מאוריהם צבאת הקלון מכבוד שעשה גם עתה והערל כי טוב עליך כוס ימין אדוני וכי קלון וכי קלון על כבודך כי חמס לבנון וחסקה ושור בהמוס יחיסן מדמי אדם מחמס ארץ קריה וכל יושבי בה. מה הועיל פסל כי פסלו יוצרו מסיכה מורה שקר כי ותח יוצר יוצרו עליו לעשות אלילים אילמים. אוי אומר לעץ הקיצה אורי לאבן דומה הוא יורה הנה הוא תפוס זהב וכסף וכל רוח אין בקרבו. ואדוני בהיכל קדשו הס מפניו כל הארץ. אוקיי, ואז השפטר אינס, נתחיל עם מה זה ההפטר של השפטר של השפטר של השבוס, שרק יש ההפטר בצד של ישראל. Okay, other mitzvahs. All right, so, Teresa. Um, okay. I will stand upon my watch and take my place at the siege. I will wait to see what he will speak to me and what I can answer my reproof. And Hashem answered me and said, Write the vision and clarify it upon tablets so that the reader may read it swiftly. For there is yet another vision about the appointed time. It will speak of the end and it will not deceive. Though it may tarry, wait it, for it uh, will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his, uh, his soul is... defiant it is unsettled to him but the righteous person shall live through his faith the man of wine also acts treacherously he is an arrogant man and does not stay at home he has widened his soul like the grave and like death he is not satisfied he gathered unto himself all the nations and assembled a unto himself all the peoples. Shall all of these not take up a parable about him and a metaphor and riddles regarding him? One will say, woe to him who, who amasses that which is not his. How long can he go on? He burdens himself head, heavily with thick mud. Will those who would bite him not rise up suddenly? And will those who would cause you to, to tremble not awaken? You will be plundered <clears throat> for them because you have pivoted many nations. Piv anyway, all the remnants of the nations uh, will... Uh, pillage, pillage you for the blood of men that you spilt and the robbery of the land, the city and all its inhabitants. Woe to him who gains evil profit for his house so that he may sit his nest up high to be rescued from the grasp of evil. He will count, you have canc counseled the shame for your house by cutting off many peoples and you have sinned against your soul. For a stone will cry out from the wall and a silver will answer it from the beams. A sliver, excuse me. 
Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a city with iniquity. Behold, it is not from Hashem, master of legions, that the peoples will toil for the fire and the nations will weary themselves for uh, nothingness. For the earth will be filled with knowledge of Hashem's glory as the waters cover the seabed. Woe to him who gives his fellow to drink. You gather your anger and, the, and intoxicate them so that you may look upon their nakedness. You are sated more with shame than with glory. You, uh, you too will drink and become confounded. The cup of Hashem's right hand is turned upon you and the vomit of shame will cover your glory. For the robbery of Lebanon will emanate you and the plunder done by your animals will destroy you because of the blood of men that you spilt and the robbery of the land, the city and all of its inhabitants. Of what avail is the graven image that its maker has carved and molten image or teacher of falsehood that is make that its maker uh, should place his trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, wake up and to silent stone arise, will it teach? Behold, it is coated with gold and silver and there is no spirit within it. For Hashem is in his holy sanctuary. Let all the world be silent before him. Yeah, well, how long are we supposed to be silent? <laughs> it's just, okay. Thought we had to do a moment of silence. Or something. But uh, thank God, you know, we're, however well or not well we, we're doing this, we're at least trying to um, consider the word of God and, and to share it with, with each other. And um, I, I realize a lot of people may never have a chance to um, to study the original Hebrew of the prophecy unless we cover it in class. So that's why I don't just go through the English commentaries. Um, so if you need me to repeat any word, uh, let me know. Okay, so God answers in verse two uh, the the plea of Habakkuk. So God does not seem to be upset with Habakkuk's prayer, and if you look again in the book of Daniel, it seems like Habakkuk's prayer was eventually had an effect on on. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar. So the now in this chapter we mentioned in verse three that it will speak the the coming vision will speak about the end. Okay, so this this uh, quite possibly is, is talking about the prophecy and Daniel about the end. Uh, so th this is all like a, a prophecy of what's going to happen in the next generation. Fascinating. So just like um, we saw that Nahum was talking about something that would happen decades later, so Habakkuk is also talking about something that would happen decades later. Okay, so now uh, let's look at verse four and verse five as a unit. Okay, so 
and then go into the commentaries there. Um, Behold, his soul is defiant, it is unsettled in him, but the righteous person, righteous person shall live through his faith. The man of wine also acts treacherously. He is an arrogant man and does not stay at home. He has widened his soul like the grave, and like death, he is not satisfied. He gathered unto himself all the nations and assembled unto himself all of the peoples. So you see a conqueror in verse 5 um, should have just stayed at home and run his country. Instead, he decided to invade someone else's borders. Now, it's, we see a parallel, and again, we, we've seen this before in class, how God has arranged that when we teach a class, it's connected to the historical progression of, of real, real things in, in our generation. It's, it's, it's very interesting how, how God is working. Uh, but, so we did not start this class until Russia invaded Ukraine. However, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, a lot of people don't realize it, but, but there has been a border dispute for, for decades, at least. Um, so therefore, Russia is not a pure metaphor for the, the Chaldeans, even though some people are, are very outraged at some of the uh, atrocities in the war, the Chaldeans were, were worse than the Russians are behaving now. So a, a conqueror is someone who is acting arrogant and all he had to do was stay at home and nobody would be complaining. But he dared to go to another country to, to try to conquer it. When countries stop um, acting with such evil that they need um, uh, that they need destruction level suffering, so then there could be world peace. Until then, the natural process of punishing nations is through another uh, uh, conquering nation. We see two ex exceptions to this: one in in Genesis and one in history. We've seen Genesis, the, the, uh, the cities of, of Sodom and Amara and their neighboring cities. Uh, so uh, those cities were, were destroyed, not by another nation. Why? why? Why is there an exception in the case of Sodom? Because if, if you look at the discussion of Abraham having his his battle with the four kings. The king of, of Sodom was, was uh, defeated by Abraham in battle. Abraham's forces defeated the king of Sodom. Of Sodom. But Abraham did not invade the city. Abraham had no interest in hurting people. He wanted to save people. So therefore, since the natural process is to destroy an, a nation embedded in evil with another nation, and that would not occur because the nation that had spiritually defeated the, them was Abraham, and he refused to carry out the normal process of conquest. Therefore, God had to bring heavenly fire to destroy Sodom and Amar. See? But the natural, natural consequence is invasion against the country that does such evil. Second cases in history, we see the Mayans, you know, uh, the Aztecs. So they, they went into human sacrifice like the, like the Canaanites. And like the Canaanites, they were, they were destined to be obliterated. Uh, but in, in the Americas in those days, there was no natural um, opposing army that was, that was a threat. So therefore, God destroyed the Mayans in a different manner through, through an illness. Pompeii destroyed by volcano. Okay, so in these cases, um, 
exception to the rule. However, with Pompeii, uh, it was a city within uh, within the Roman area, and Rome didn't deserve to fall, even though that city exceeded Rome. Uh, to a lesser extent, we see uh, by um, New Orleans in America, United States, New Orleans during Mardi Gras had um, immorality in the streets, in the open immorality, and, and the police were not allowed to arrest people. So they had such corrupt uh, laws. It makes sense. That's why that city was, was uh, destroyed during Katrina. And we see that uh, the American economy was strong until President George W. Bush tried to save uh, New Orleans and as if there were, had never been a destruction from heaven. So better to let New Orleans heal slowly and repent than to restore their capacity to have immorality in the streets again during Mardi Gras. scenario is that a nation does evil to a destruction level event. Uh, that destruction level event is usually through an opposing force. And in the old days, uh, nations looked forward to conquering their enemies for the sake of the, uh, the spoils of war. So a nation had to deserve to be a conqueror. They had to have some sort of merit to become a conqueror. And then they became a conqueror and got the spoils of war. However much cruelty they did was partially connected to their choice for evil or good. <clears throat> okay, so when in verse four it says, um, his soul is defined, it is unsettled in him. So the commentaries uh, mostly refer this to the conqueror, or would be conqueror, but the righteous person shall live through his faith. It's possible the righteous person will be saved even though the, the country is being uh, conquered. Uh, but what is it, the, the righteous person, his faith? The righteous person is if the country had been benevolent, then the, the Chaldeans would never have been destroyed by the Persians. During the, reign, during the reign of Belshazzar as, as seen in the book of Daniel. If they had been faithful to being good neighbors, faithful neighbor, good neighbor, uh, so therefore uh, there would have been no destruction of the Babylonians. They created their own destruction by not staying at home. Therefore in this context, Faith is not just a belief. Faith is acting faithfully. <clears throat> now, this is a long commentary in the English, but it's a really fascinating concept because um, how far does faith go? So that's what we're going to cover now. Any questions before we start? <clears throat> okay, in the R Scroll Milstein edition, this is on page on page three twenty six. Right hand column. Behold, his soul is defined. Our translation. Follows Rashi translates um, translates it as an expression of insolence and defiance, and explains that the soul of this wicked person Nebuchadnezzar 
is continuously wrathful and aspires only to devour others. He is never satisfied nor content with that which he already possesses and is therefore deserving of punishment. Radak translates it, the word ufla, as arrogant. <coughs> And also explains this passage as a reference to Nebuchadnezzar and his grandson, Belshazzar. Who, who were both arrogant and faithful, faith, faithless, fearless of God's punishments uh, in, in a foolish way. Rabbi Moshe Kimchi, Radak's father, uh, relates that the word upla uh, uh, relates it to Ophel Khan from Isaiah chapter 32, citadel or fortress, and explains that one whose soul is not upright would place himself in a fortress to seek refuge from his enemy, rather than turn towards God and pray to him for salvation. The righteous person, however, is different, for his soul is humble and he always fears God. He will therefore always live by his faith in God and avoid the evil that befalls the wicked. Live by his faith. So we're connecting again ethical or moral choices to the faith, not just faith alone. But the righteous person shall live through his faith. The righteous person lives with steadfast faith that all that occurs is from God. He does not credit his own merits or strength for his success, Matsudos. This, this, this alludes to the concept of humility, humility as a sign of faithfulness. He surrenders himself totally to God. <clears throat> That's another sign of humility. And places the complete trust in him, not deviating at all from his ways. This is the commentary of Maharal. Habakkuk is referring to uh, Je 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 Jeconia. Uh, That's a king of Judah. Also known as Jehoachim. <clears throat> the 15th monarch of the kingdom of Judah, who was exiled by Nebuchadnezzar in 2 Kings chapter 24, and remained righteous while he was in exile. Upon Nebuchadnezzar's death, his successor, Abil Merodach, uh, released Jehoniah from imprisonment and elevated him above all the kings who were with him in Babylon. Alternatively, the righteous person referring to the Israelites who were exiled to Babylon together with King Zedekiah, refused to be coerced into worshiping idols. When King Cyrus of Persia conquered Babylon, he spared the righteous Jews and even granted them permission to rebuild the Holy Temple, Radak. Targum Yonasan translates the word emuna, faith, as honesty. <coughs> Unlike the wicked whose soul is not upright, the righteous person lives with honesty. The Talmud in Marcus, uh, chap, uh page 23b, expounds on this verse. Rabbi Simlai commented, 630 commandments were, were, were related to Moses. Uh, King David came and established 11 ethical requirements for fulfillment of these commandments. Isaiah came and reduced them to six. Micah came and reduced them to three. Then came Habakkuk and reduced them to one, namely, the righteous person shall live through his faith. Now, it's very important to understand what Sgwara is saying. This cannot mean that each of the aforementioned prophets reduced the requirement of mitzvah observance from the original 613 to 1163 or 1, for one of the basic tenets of Judaism is that the commandments of the Torah are eternal and no commandment may be discarded, as per Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, Rivan and Makos explains that, the originally, that originally the entire nation was on a high enough spiritual level to perform all 613 commandments <clears throat> with the proper intensity, thereby meriting the world to come. As time went on, the spiritual level of the nation declined, and people were not able to fulfill all the commandments in the desired manner. King David therefore set forth these 11 ethical requirements to which one would merit the world to come. In other words, keep all the commandments, but if you want to make sure you go to heaven, make sure you're, you're keeping these 11. The Chavetz Chaim prophets uh, on, on, um, on Chabakov explains that the prophets never intended 
to reduce the requirement of mitzvah observance. Observance. Their intent was to pinpoint the mitzvah that the people of that generation needed to reinforce and observe diligently. But the basic idea common to all of these prophets is that one must live with a muna, with faith and trust in God. One must realize that everything that ever occurred, all that is now taking place, and all that will ever take place is the will of God. Uh, and Maharsha and Maharal uh, discuss this further. Malam sees this verse as, as a praise to the righteous person who knows that God will someday send his Redeemer. He does not have it, place his faith in these false, false prophets or in those who have claimed to have calculated the proper date of coming of the end of days. The righteous person uh, faithfully waits for God to send the Messiah. Amen. Okay, so there's uh, some verses in, in uh, Proverbs I'd like us to check out. If you could please turn to the second chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 2. In the Art Scroll Stone Edition Tanakh, that would be on page 115. Uh, it'll be 1570, 1571 in the uh, Hebrew English bilingual. In the Art Scroll edition that's similar to the Reuben and Milstein edition of Proverbs, that would be on page 18 and 19. Laman Telech Bederch Tovim, Orochos Tzadikim Tishmor, Yesham Yishkenu Oretz, Usamimim Yivasru Va, Roshayim Aretz Yikaresu, so all of chapter two was discussing until this point, it's being summed up here in the last three verses of chapter two of Proverbs. Uh, in order that you may walk in the way of the, of the good and keep the paths of the righteous, for the upright will dwell in the land forever, and the wholehearted will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the faithless uprooted from it. So, if you want to be righteous, be upright and wholehearted, be ethical and moral, but the wicked are cut off because they're faithless. So, we see a connection between faith and ethics and morality. If faith is cut off from ethics and morality, and if uh, people start having the ends justifying the means, so therefore it's, it's faithless. If it's faithless and someone is, is trying to do good with faithfulness, you know, this is a concept that was known since the time of the Mishnah and before, mitzvah hababa vera vera. A mitzvah that comes through a sin is a sin. If it's unethical, it removes it as being part of God's plan by the way of righteousness. So it can't be a representation of God's plan of righteousness. Now we see by Nebuchadnezzar, he can represent God's plan of a nation needing to be punished. But that in and of itself is not a, a righteousness. It's just it, in, a, in a bad way, he fit the bill. So it was, it was called to, to do it. Um, whereas uh, when we're choosing to be faithful, we cannot surrender ethics and morality to achieve that. If we are, we are, not, we are not being faithful. That's the clear implication of chapter two. The entire chapter two of Mishlei, really we could read the whole chapter, uh, but I want to make sure we finish uh, the book of Habakkuk uh, tonight. But really you can read the whole ch chapter two of, of Mishlei. It's all building up to the last three verses. The last three verses talks only about this concept, that ethics and morality have to be connected 
to one's faithfulness if you want to be called faithful. So if you were to try to take this quote from verse 4 of Habakkuk chapter 2 out of context and say, but the righteous person shall live through his faith, So how far can you take it? And since the Talmud and Makos does take this verse, this half of the verse out of, out of the context of the chapter, right? So therefore, that's why I wanted us to, to discuss it here together. Uh, we see in comparison with Proverbs, it's, it's, there's no foundation to assume that this is faith of itself. It's faith that's connected to righteousness. It says the righteous person shall live with his faith. It doesn't say the, per the person shall live with his faith. So in other words, he has to be righteous. He has to maintain his ethical and moral bearing. Do you see that? It says, Sadiq, righteous person, it doesn't say gever, the guy, it says an already righteous person, a person trying to achieve good with his faith will live. A wicked person with his faith, there is no proof from this verse he can live. Now we've discussed previously in classes how even a wicked person even before he fully does repentance, can survive even a time of danger. But this verse cannot refer to that. Is there any questions or doubts to this understanding? Because it, you know, it's very easy to misquote this. Can I ask you a question? Of course. How, how does a person find their faith? How does a person get faith? If faith has to come first, where is that faith coming from? How did they get it? Well, in, in this verse, it, it, it implies righteousness. What is righteousness? Okay, so remember, uh, Judah, Judah sinned less than the northern kingdoms of, of Ephraim and, and uh, other kingdoms. But they were the ones with God's temple. So therefore, they were held to a higher standard. So when they were punished, they were punished more severely than the Northern Kingdom, in a sense. Northern Kingdom was, was uh, they lost their society the, in the future, even though there, there will be a remnant, as mentioned in, in um, Hosea and Amos, um, will be a remnant that, that's always with uh, Judah. Nevertheless, um, Nevertheless, the, their society ended forever of the Northern Kingdom. But the Judeans suffered from, from torments more. Uh, however, their societies were, were, were perpetuated forever. So it's, it's a balance. But uh, let's, let's look again in Isaiah. And this concept is repeated several times in Isaiah in other places in, in scripture as well. So turn to the first chapter of Isaiah, verse 27. Isaiah chapter one, verse 27. In the Art Scroll Stone edition bilingual, that would be in the nine, page 956, 957. Tzion b'mishpati pade v'shaveh b'k'tzedakah. Zion will be redeemed through justice and those who return to her through righteousness. Okay, but what does the verse right before that say? Verse 26. Verse 26. 
Then I will store your judges as at first and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called city of righteousness, faithful city. And that is summed up in justice and charity. Justice and charity. Okay, continuing in our chapter, chapter two of Chabakov, uh, verse six and onward. Oh, Shirley, that answered your question sufficiently or you have a follow-up? No, no, I still don't know how I got my faith. I still <laughs> don't understand. Huh? I don't understand how, where my faith came from. What made me have faith? Oh, what, what made you have faith? Yes. Okay, well, in, I, I in order to be able to do these things, if I don't have faith, then it doesn't, I can't right, apply I, it. Right, so that's so, what I meant. Okay, well, let me say how I got faith. I got faith because of the justice of the Torah, because there is no document like it in, in world history, and it is consistent. You know, if 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 you're able to follow the uh, Masoretic text, you see it's consistent over the span of over a thousand years. This concept agrees with that concept. This concept is explained in that concept. Again, only, only, only the creator of the world could possibly have been the same author with, with all these different regimes. For, for example, you know, when, when uh, we saw when, when President Trump left, uh, President Biden changed everything he could of what Trump did. And that's what Trump did the, when President Obama left. He tried to change everything uh, that, that Obama did as soon as uh, he got into office. So that, that's, that's normal if someone disagrees. So why is it that for over a thousand years, nobody is editing the words of Moses? And they're upholding the idea that you cannot add or subtract from the Torah. Understand? So the Torah is the reason I'm faithful. Right. So <laughs> by hearing and by hearing and learning Torah, that gives us our faith. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, with, because without Torah, there is cruelty. Humans keep mm -hmm. choosing cruelty. Right. But with Torah, we can choose a higher path. Right. You know, Where Rabbi, is isn't, it, isn't it um, that, you know, they, the Jewish people say that I will do and I will hear. They were they were acting mm -hmm. on Torah before they understood Torah, before they realized, you know, what they were doing. They didn't have to understand it. They just did it. And so I think this action, uh, this action of, of being righteous gives you the faith to be righteous. Mm -hmm. Now, but if you consider um, so <clears throat> many of that generation uh, they, they died in the wilderness. You understand that uh, there were there was still um, ethical and or moral breakdowns in that generation, and they had more more miracles than the average generation. So why is that? It's it's because in part they were exposed to miracles before they were exposed to the truth. That's yeah, that's true. How much, of, yeah. how much of an ethical uh, ethical message can you get from a miracle? 
you have to interpret it. But if you're first ta taught ethics and morality and say, the God who does this is going to redeem us from Egypt, you know, that's another thing. But the Egyptians outlawed the teaching of Torah, you know, in that concept, because it was a, uh, you know, there was a tradition from Joseph about the Hebrews leaving Egypt. So therefore, discussing the legend of the forefathers uh, is, is uh, tantamount to inciting rebellion, you understand? But it's better to first be exposed to the to, to an ethical and moral system and then reinforce that. But if you have an arbitrary event that occurs, it's open to interpretation. And we see later that the, the, the snake that, remember Moses in the book of Numbers uh, made a snake that if anyone was, was bitten by poison, poisonous serpents, they could stare at the snake and think about the God who created snakes. And then they would be freed of the poison. They, they would be instantly cured. And then in after hundreds of years later, after the time of uh, idolatry was int introduced in, in Israel, so people started to worship the, the, uh, the serpent of Moses as an idol, because it, it had a magical power. So King Hezekiah uh, destroyed it because it became an idol. And therefore, therefore it, the miracle, the great cure was not a guarantee of ethics. The best guarantee of ethics is to be aware there's a choice to make and then be reinforced. You know, like for example, the manna falling strengthened faith. Because they first told, you know, God will provide for you, and God provided. You understand? That's why their children who, who was who were raised in the desert were all righteous in the generation of Joshua. They saw it and understood it. Right. Or they understood it and saw it. They understood it and saw it. Yes. That gave them faith. Yes. Whereas okay. before, they saw it and then uh, tried to understand it. Right. I get it. I oh, got it. you got it. <laughs> I got it. Got it. Got it. Oh. Uh, okay, I'll, don't worry. I'll, I'm going to judge you favor favorably and take that on faith. Thank you. Okay. I hope that pun was enough to keep you awake for a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, Rabbi Allen. May I add something? Oh, sure, Tim. Yep. Welcome. Uh, yeah, so, uh, the uh, chapter two, uh, verse four, where's the, what we're just talking about, the just shall live by his faith. Yeah. This is actually, um, it's, quoted, it's quoted a few times in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul he wrote a lot of the New Testament letters um, to the churches in that first century. And what he tries to explain is basically the doctrine of justification by faith in that um, the question is how, how, how a sinner can be justified or uh, made right before a holy and perfect God. And the understanding that he gets that is basically when, uh, when Christ was, was upon the earth, he well, was... Yeah, but obviously we're not we're not talking about um, the different uh, faith here, but you know it, it, it the idea. You see, you're saying that because through faith, it, it's enough in and of itself. It's it, it's just that concept is not consistent with with the Hebrew scriptures, the actual Hebrew scriptures of Tanakh, uh, as as opposed to the, the you know the New Testament is. Uh, perhaps better described as a, as a Greek scripture. It's not, it's not a Hebrew scripture, it's really. Um, but we have some other uh, former Christians here. Um, anyone else would like to comment on, to Tim? Because you've, uh, you've uh, personally uh, experienced what he went through. Do we have uh, any former Christians who would like to comment? 
Well, you know, I, under, I understand the, uh, you know, the idea of this, but it's and it goes exactly back to what we're talking about with Moses looking at the snake is if, if you don't have anything else to focus on, they try to, you know, you have to um, or the capability to look beyond. And this is the capability of realizing the unique oneness of God, that there is nothing else but God. There is nothing here but God there, there, you know. And so therefore, if, until you realize, until you understand the unique oneness of God, you can't, you know, you need intermediaries and you need a little statue with a snake on it or you need a man on a cross or you need these things psychologically you need them you don't have the wherewithal the capability to um to connect with that unique oneness until you know you study and understand uh this system that the torah and and the prophets and all of this are bringing forward if you don't have that you know you're you're searching for something and uh and and you need a you need a tool and obviously the 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 danger of that just like the danger of the snake is that that tool can lead you off in into uh away from god and not closer to god that's the two-edged sword so uh, Russell, so when you when you were a Christian, were you looking at it kind of like the the generation of the wilderness, where um, where you 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 experienced it and then thought about the ethics instead of the other way around, like I, I was suggesting, is preferable? Yeah, the uh, um, the it, it was more. It was it was kind of like you, you realized that. Well, you know, for me personally, what I realized is that the system that was here, you know, the the New Testament, um, the 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 apostles and all of these people, they were not, they did not pull away from uh, what uh, the Torah was basically teaching uh, in the New Testament. So therefore. Uh, all of the things that was taught later on in Christianity, how this was done away with and that was done away with, I found not to be so. Uh, you know, Paul sacrificed, you know, in, in chapters 20 of Acts and and, and uh, Peter was still eating kosher and blah, blah, blah. And the whole thing, the whole system was still in place. So the, the system and the ethics that were put into place by the Torah, they were never abandoned by the New Testament uh, characters. What happened was is that uh, the church, uh, when the church developed, they eschewed them to fit another uh, group of people. And so what I'm, what we're looking at is, is, is probably true. You know, once you learn the, the system and what is going on uh, within the Torah and the Tanakh, you can't undo that. And you've got to plug that into everything that uh, you do or think and it didn't plug into the New Testament and the church. It doesn't. It just won't do it. At some point, it's going to break down. Oh, why do you think yeah. there's, do you yeah. think because of, a, like, you know, just, you know, I don't have as much exposure as you do to the New Testament, but there's some things that seem to contradict others within the New Testament itself, not even talking about the, the, the Hebrew scripture. Um, so is it because... It, it's not consistent with itself. You cannot get the same ethical uh, bearing that you could get from 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 the Tanakh. Is well, absolutely, right? it is. It is. It is not. It is not a document. Once you once you study the document and look at it, it, it is not a consistent uh, document as far as things being added to it and took away from it. We know that the New Testament was in the hands of the monks for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, and and exclusively uh, to that point to where things were added and took away and 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 made askew. We don't see that within the Hebrew writings because of the uh, the moral and ethical value of the Jewish people to maintain the integrity of the scriptures. The um, the uh, Roman church did not have that uh, integrity to keep it and, and, and to keep it pure, uh, uh, purified in that context. Um, it was uh, the New Testament was a tool used to uh, 
basically control the peasants and build a church that that uh, created a a database for uh, the king to know how how many people they were uh, to collect taxes, to create armies, to have stuff fighting men, blah, blah, blah. That's why we see a church that is baptized at birth and, and you have to have a a, uh, a ritual done at death so they could keep up with who's born and who dies and how many uh, taxpayers are in that uh, parish and how many fighting men are in that parish of that age. It's a, it's a, it's a machine that is not conducted in the same way the Jewish scriptures are conducted. And uh, and that right there begins to, um, like I said, eat away at the morality that was set up, uh, uh, the system that was set up in uh, the Tanakh. Okay, now, last class we discussed, thank you, Russell, and thanks for the question, uh, Tim. So last class we discussed the um, the differences between um, uh, malevolent idolatry and uh, ben more uh, benevolent idolatry. So we see where there was human sacrifice, God demanded the cruelty end in the very generation that uh, it began. Uh, whereas we, we see um, God was patient 200 years with, with the Northern tribes in Israel. And he, he's been patient 4,000 years in China with Buddhism. So until there's cruelty to humans, uh, until there's a malevolent human sacrificing uh, cruel form of religion, God does not interfere with human choice, even if it's not good for them. Uh, that's that's how, God, how much God respects free will. Uh, so, so it, would you, uh, Russell, <clears throat> would you define uh, Christianity as more of a benevolent idolatry or is it closer to, in any way to Judaism? Uh, but it, it certainly doesn't seem like a, a, anything like the Moloch worship, which was uh, cruel. No, the the religion, the religion itself is benevolent. How, however, uh, the people uh, that are operating within the system of morality of the New Testament were not benevolent. And we, we've seen this within the, the Crusades and the Inquisition and all of these different things. We've seen some uh, horrendous uh, cruelty to humanity coming from the, uh, the Christian faith, but it is not... It was not uh, through the Christian religion, and, and, and it's it's really a paradox, you know, because and because there is no uh, accountability within uh, the Christian faith, even though it says, it, you know, I can be benevolent here and be 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 a, a kind. But then if uh, the Pope or the King justifies a war for whatever reason that he has, then that justification of, of uh, that supersedes the teaching of the New Testament. And is what was who was that? Uh, it was Gandhi that said, you know, that he would be a Christian, uh, you know, if it weren't for Christians. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, I. I've, I've met a lot of different types of Christians, and I've personally been surprised that there's so many different denominations. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, and I, I've seen um, marriages of, of people from different denominations of Christian, Christianity. They, they could consider marrying certain denominations, but they would never, ever consider marrying other denominations of, within Christianity itself. So. In the concept of ethics and morals as, as faith, why is there such a wide range of of ethical philosophies within Christianity? It's it's the it, this it, this well really to, to to really answer your question, it is uh, the Judaizing of the New Testament. 
And we can go back, we can start off with the with the basis being the, the Catholic Church, who is totally away, took totally away from the Jewish uh, dynamic of scriptures, and they made themselves, they, you know, as a replacement theology, they made themselves the standard. And, and then what happened with um, Luther and, and all of the other uh, reformists is they were they were bringing that uh, they were Judaizing, they were bringing more of the, the Jewish concepts and stuff back into it. Um, and so now when we look at today, we can look at the more uh, Judaized, the more spiritualized the denomination is uh, those different layers and dynamics have built barriers between uh, people that, and I guarantee you, they won't, they won't uh, marry from uh, one denomination to the other. We had, um, uh, I was at a, at a, at a wedding one time to where one was a Catholic and one was not a Catholic and they weren't converting. And so they had to have two separate communions. They wouldn't even eaten from the same body of Christ so to speak, because of their denominations were so dynamically opposed to one another. When you start looking at things like that from a Taurus perspective, it's like you and you start seeing that uh, it is the Torah that sets the standard in morality and actions that creates that I think creates and builds that faith and once you're operating within it and um, it, it's going to set that standard to where all of these different denominations and all, you know, one's doing this and one's doing that. Um, it, it's, it does break down the faith system. It, it's, it's not something that builds faith. When you have, um, you know, whatever it is, 2000 denominations, uh, Christian uh, New Testament denominations, it is not a faith building dynamic. When you have a single Torah and a unified uh, attempt to keep that Torah pure and its teachings pure, then that is a faith building dynamic within itself. And then for the non-Jew to realize that he was a part of that Torah. He's not excluded from that Torah. That's when it all comes together. Yeah, uh, by the way, from the Jewish perspective, uh, we don't um, recommend eating any Messiah that you find. Um, okay, that's just, just our, our thing. Uh, not kosher. So, um, but um, now, you know, th this, this concept um, in Habakkuk chapter two, of uh, living by faith, <clears throat> you see in the context of, chapter, of verses four and five, the person has to be righteous, verse four, and he has to not be arrogant. The opposite of arrogant is humble. Uh, so, so, so let's look at Proverbs again, chapter 22, verse verse 4. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. The result of humility is fear of Hashem, fear of the Lord, wealth, honor, and life. So the result of or in the wake of humility comes these things. Fear of the Lord, wealth, honor, and life. So, so in other words, and, and you know, the Talmud has repeated stories about a person giving charity is blessed by heaven with more wealth. A person not giving charity uh, or, or being corrupt with weights and, and uh, trying to steal just a, a few pieces of grain here or there, they, they, they uh, are punished. So it, these, these things are, it's all a consistent system we see uh, through the, the uh, through through the Chumash, uh, five books of Moses, and all the way um, into later generations, and again, it, it stays consistent. The same theme over and over and over. And then remember, 
the first generation of the, the uh, sages of the Talmud were the students, the disciples of the prophets themselves. In, in uh, the Book of Kings in Hebrew, it's called Nebiim, the disciples of the prophets. So the very first generation of the, the sages of the Talmud were disciples of prophets. So it, the whole system is consistent with each other. And, and again, the, the Mishnah and the, the Medrash Genesis Rabbah, the Medrash uh, Mechilta, the Medrash Sifra, the Medrash Sifri. Uh, so all of these were written down before the New Testament was written down. And it's, it was all in writing. Okay, so this is a consistent system that was known and, and in black and white and consistent for, for over a thousand years. It's just really amazing. And, um, and you know, if from that perspective, there's even before you go into the context of what's in there or not, there is no comparison with, with later texts from the time um, after, after the Talmud, you know. Uh, so, but the you know foundation of the Talmud started as disciples of the prophets, and the system is consistent with the with the Tanakh. And if if anyone tries to go against the word of Moses, from Joshua to the rabbis of the Mishnah, it doesn't matter that Moses' word comes first. So it, it's all consistent, and the the morality is linked to it. So to find faith, a person has to be humble and they have to be righteous. And if they don't have that, what kind of faith do they have? You know, I remember, uh, you know, that there was advertisements and things like that. People say, believe in yourself, right? So if a person had faith in themselves, where, where's God? for them, you know. We have to have an objective stand, standard. Uh, even Socrates, the, the, <laughs> the Greeks were not known as the um, paragon of monotheism, but uh, Socrates uh, said you have to have objective standards. Uh, otherwise, the standards become meaningless. Um, so, I guess that, that's the situation. And I, I suppose we're going to have to pause at this point. I, I expected to finish the entire book of Kabbalah um, tonight, but Tim asked a good question. Uh, and I, I guess we can continue next week. Uh, hopefully you could uh, come again, Tim. And uh, well, thanks, Russell, for your very uh, detailed uh, explanation. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I get too detailed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any any further questions by anyone? Really quick. Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say um interesting. Um so the uh the understanding um within within the, the, the Judaic faith is that uh, salvation ultimately is attained maybe through good works and living righteously and following different uh, precepts and, and and trying to strive and do good. Um the thing that actually was the backbone of the of the Protestant Reformation was the, was the doctrine of justification by faith, it was, and it was a rediscovery of biblical truth, which basically said that people um, aren't justified by 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 the work that they do, but rather um, by what the Lord Jesus Christ did in His perfect life, sacrificial death, and then resurrection, and it's and it's by believing in that, um, but one is declared righteous before God, and in I understand that there may be a Christian belief, but it, 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 as far as um, talking yes. about Tanakh, it doesn't seem connected whatsoever. And, yeah. and you know, it's interesting because, in other words, uh, you just like when you're speaking, you first have to think about what you're speaking. Uh, you know, unless, but unless you're either a politician, a lawyer, or or a teenager, but <laughs> otherwise, you usually got to think about what you're going to say. Uh, so similarly, we have to have. Uh, intellectual uh, capacity we have to have a, a, a uh, 
you know, perhaps a verbal content and, and a, then a, an action or doing. Mm -hmm. and, and when you have the whole package, then you have faith. And for example, uh, if, if a person vows to be faithful, but then cheats on the spouse, what is that? How do you call that faith? You see what I'm saying? Even if it's they, their intention, and even if they pledged, uh, uh, whether they pl pledged by Moses or, 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 or Gandhi or, or anyone they wanted to pledge by, what does it mean if it's not actually faithful? But that's the, that's, that's the thing within within that is that uh, within the Protestant, uh, if they, they, they don't believe that they have righteousness because no one's taught them the Torah uh, and how they fit into that and where those uh, standards and uh, are that you can obtain. I mean, there is I mean, there are plenty of Protestant people that uh, don't murder, don't kill, don't steal, don't rob, don't don't uh, sexual immorality and all of this stuff. And they 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 attempt it, but they don't realize that that is an obtainable goal. And so what they have to do is create a, a intermediary to where if they fail, that they can uh, that they can have something else to to fall back on when when they do that thing when they when they when they are uh, 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 have a, a marital uh, malfunction so to speak and and they they didn't keep their vows and things like that they have something else to to go on that they need and in the but the the basis of the problem is just this uh, they don't realize what the Torah is and how they are interacting with it through uh, being a righteous non-Jew. And uh, that's what Tim wants to say also. Yeah. Um, what one other thing I was just going to say was that, so there's, a, there's an epistle in the New Testament, it's the book, it's Romans, and uh, Paul goes over a different doctrine and he, he mentions in Romans chapter three that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he, and, and he mentions, you know, justification by faith. And he says in chapter four, he talks about Abraham. And so justification by faith, it's always been justification by faith. Abraham was justified well, by if, faith. If, if you want, you could ask that the question next time, but we're, we're running out of time, Tim. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, you're still welcome. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, we thank God uh, Russell's here, and we have other people as well. Uh, also, um, uh, for can I say one real short thing? I know you're in a hurry. Oh, sure. One sure. real short thing because I was involved in as, as a Christian shoot also. But before I came to Torah to learn Torah, my faith was in a man. My faith now is in the one and only true God. It can't be in a man. I discovered that. And that's that's the the whole thing right there. That's the difference in the two. We can go about it any way we are taught, but it's the truth is our faith cannot be put in a man. Our faith has to be in the one and true God, the one that made us, that created us. He's the one and only true God. And that's where our faith is in Judaism. That's where the whole thing, it's all about that. And that's what I have to believe now, what I discovered I had to believe, and what I am bound to believe and bound in. Yeah, that's he is my... That's exactly yeah, right, that's, Sheridan. That, that's, a, that's exactly that. what the rabbis put thinking, uh, talking about it, what I'm saying here yeah. is... He was. It's that. It's that. That co. That that ethics and that morality and that 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 you see within Torah. You realize that that your faith has to be based in God directly and not as a, right. not indirectly. If it, if it's yeah. at all possible, the only way to obtain that was you studying Torah. And if you right. exactly if you didn't study the Torah, you could never you you never could, know. You you can't you can't get out of it. You can't get out of the system. Uh, and until you can, you can study Torah from a, uh, a, a more authentic um, perspective than what is offered within uh, the, the Protestant or Catholic churches the, from what they offer it. And uh, you, you'll ne you just never get it, even though in, in, in the back of their mind, they're going to say the same thing. Oh, of course, I'm believing in God. And, and then that's how... Um, 
but in uh, it's not it's not once you realize that within the context of Torah, you re you realize that it's not, and that's and you can never go back. Once you realize it, you can you can never go back. You can never switch back to it. Everything ultimately, though, in the in the uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, point to I, Mashiach I'm sorry, I, points to the Savior, I, in that people have, I, people I, need to be saved. He needs to stop. Yeah, you know, the the welcome, welcome. But I tell you what, TM, be glad to. Uh, won't you messenger me, or if you can, friend me on Facebook or whatever, and uh, and messenger me, and and uh, you know, I'll I'll be glad to uh, go over with uh, you know these things probably in a lot better detail than in this format, and. Um, and give you some uh, true uh, Christian perspective on the Torah and the Tanakh from uh, the hindsight, once it, coming out of it and realizing what the uh, Jewish perspective is in the Tanakh for the non-Jew and how it works and how redemption, faith, all that works and how, because I don't care how many times somebody accepts Jesus, you're still going to not kill, not steal, not kill. You can accept Jesus till you're blue in the face, but until you have to still act right. Man. And if not, and if you can't act right, then you repent. It is a very simple mm -hmm. system in the Torah. And and it, and it works simply. There is no, absolutely no need for the New Testament whatsoever. It is an it is a it is an addition uh, that was not necessary. Well, let's let's uh, continue more next time. But the, thank the you, Rabbi. Of, oh, thank God. And, and the focus, of course, is learning. Thank you, the, Hashem. Uh, the Tanakh. Thanks, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, guys. All right. Thank you.